Good afternoon. My name is Kent Mormon, and I am the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as Dr. Cog TAC. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order of the August 24th Dr. Cog TAC. As a reminder for agenda item questions or comments, please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or you would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you are also unmuted on your end. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the question box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. At this time, Melinda will uh, take roll call of the Dr. Cog TAC members. If for any reason you do not hear your name, please email Melinda at mstevens at drcog.org so she can add your name to your record. Melinda. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we have Aaron Busto, Alex Heidwright, Alvin Vidal Sanchez, Amanda Brimmer, Andrea LaRue, Art Griffith, Ben Pierce, Beth Delabo, Bill Soroy, Brad Calvert, Brody Ayers, Brian Weimer, Chris Chavon, Chris Hudson, Danny Harriman, David Ulane, John Slutter, Deborah Basket, Emily Lindsay, Henry Braxma, James Eusen, Jean Santon, Jeff Dakenbring, Jennifer Carpenter, Jessica Micklebust, Joanne Matson, John Cotton, Jordan Rudell, Julie George, Karen Schneiders, Kelly Heaton, Kevin Ash, Lawrence Tillong, Lisa Hood, Lisa Nguyen, Megan Davis, Melanie Chiquette, Myron Ora, Nathaniel Miner, Richard Pilgrim, Robert Spotts, Sangu Lee, Sarah Grant, Stephen Strominger, Steve Cook, Steve Durian, Tom Reif, Celeste Stragan, Andy Taylor, Melinda Stevens, Greg McKinnon, Jacob Rieger, Kent Mormon, Ron Papsdorf, Todd Cottrell, and Travis Noon. And with that, we do have a quorum. Thank you, Melinda. We will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and your uh, line will be muted. Melinda, uh, please unmute all participants at this time. Okay, and at this time, everyone should have the ability to either raise their hand or unmute themselves via phone. Okay, and we'll give just a moment for any hand raises. Okay, uh, looks like at this time, I do not see any hands raised. Okay, then we will proceed on. Um, Is there any discussion or questions about the June 22nd, 2020 TAC meeting? Please use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak. Once it is your turn, staff will unmute your microphone and call on you to speak. Please make sure you are also unmuted on your end. Melinda, do we have any hands raised at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I... I'm not seeing any hands raised. Okay, then they'll uh, stand approved and we'll move on to the next item. The first action item that we will take action on today is a discussion of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program or TIP amendments. Todd, with Cottrell will be presenting this item. Todd. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so this afternoon, we have two amendments for your consideration. Um, the first is CDOT Region 1 I-25 Valley Highway Phases 3 and 4. Uh, Region 1 proposes to reduce the state Senate Bill 1 fund from $60 million to $575,000 due to the COVID-19 impact to state revenues. The remaining funds will be used preliminary um, for investigation work like soil sampling and high-level design. Uh, Region 1 indicates that the right-of-way purchases are still a priority, but have just moved down their list a bit due to COVID. Uh, so the second project is also uh, from Region 1 and is a new project for bridge reconstruction at I-70 in Harlan Street 
where $21.5 million of state Senate Bill 267 funding will be used. So again, there's only two amendments for your consideration this afternoon. Uh, both of these am amendments have been found to conform with the state implementation plan for air quality. And uh, the motion before you would be to recommend to the RTC the amendments to the 20 to 23 tip. Be happy to take any questions or comments that you may have. Are there any questions or comments for Todd? If so, please raise your hand and Melinda will call on you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do have a question or comment from Steve Durian. So Steve, you should have the ability to speak now. Yes, on the bridge replacement at Harlan, is that just uh, just the bridge itself or is, would there be any other work associated with the, uh, uh, say, you know, intersection improvements uh, for the off ramps or on ramps? Uh, so, Steve, that's my understanding, but certainly if there's anyone from Region 1 that would like to chime in um, and add to that. Uh, we do have a hand raised from uh, Paul DeSatis. So, Paul, go ahead. Yeah, hey, um, yeah, Steve, the, uh, that is our plan, just to replace that structure. Although, um, you know, obviously we're in the very beginning stages of that bridge project, but um, Predominantly, it's just because the bridge is in poor condition and we'd like to get a bunch of those um, poor rated bridges on the I-70 corridor replaced. Um, you know, we'll look at other aspects of how we get into it, um, but right now it's predominantly a bridge replacement project. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for Todd? Uh, we did uh, have a recent hand raise from uh, Rick Pilgrim. So, Rick. Go ahead. Looks like you're muted on your end. There you go. Yeah, I got it. Uh, well, Todd or or maybe Paul, um, the uh, the change for the I-25 project is is quite substantial, from 60 million to less than to about a half a million. And uh, Todd, you said that it still remains a priority for the right-of-way purchase. This will give them a chance to do some investigations. Um, it, is it put off a number of years or just a couple of years? Can, can you explain the deferment a little bit more? Uh, certainly, I think, and I actually we'll turn that back over to Paul if, if he wants to take that. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's it's still on our, our on our uh, list right now, but uh, we're putting in for a Chrissy grant with the federal government, and we're hoping that uh, we actually have a match of ten ten million dollars, and we're hoping to get the other forty million through this Chrissy grant. If that doesn't work out, we're looking at some other innovative financing methodologies to uh, fund that project. Um, we just do not have the uh, 267 funds necessary to proceed with the original uh, 60 million that we had there. Well, that's great. Uh, I, uh, I, I think it's a terrific project uh, as it would come to full fruition. So uh, I'm glad that you're looking for alternate ways to, to get that moving. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Um, we're still very interested in the project and we're uh, uh, going to proceed forward and see how this Christie grant goes first. So thanks for the question. Are there any other uh, questions or comments for Todd? Uh, yes, we do have another hand raise from Art Griffith. So Art, go ahead. Um, it's not really a question. It's uh, proposed action to recommend approval of the proposed amendment. Okay, is that a motion then, Art? Yes, yes, Todd. I mean, Kurt. Okay, this can't, can't, this can't. Um, so I have a motion on table by Art. Is there a second? If you'd raise your hand, we'll call on you. Okay, it looks like we have a second from Brian Weimer. Brian, go ahead. I second that motion. Okay, thank you. We have a motion and a second. Is there any additional questions or discussion? Please raise your hand.
I don't see any other hands. Okay. Um, we'll unmute the attack members at this time and their alternates representing the members only for a verbal vote. All those in favor, signify by saying A or I. Aye. 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 All those opposed by saying no. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to our second action item, uh, discussion of amending the 20 fiscal year 20, fiscal year 21 United Planning, Unified Planning Work Program, known as the UPWP. And again, Todd, I believe you have this, this presentation or discussion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, again. Uh, so just a reminder of what the uh, UPWP document is before we talk a little bit about the amendments. Uh, the UPWP is a two-year federally required document uh, and basically serves as a tool for the scheduling, budgeting, and monitoring of all the planning activities um, for Dr. Cog's use of the federal planning funds. Uh, this two-year program was first adopted back in July of 2019 and last amended earlier this year in May. Uh, so this amendment is necessary to really complete a couple items. Uh, it is to update the FY21 revenues, which was just a slight increase, and then how those revenues will be expended. And those are included in both Table 1 and Table 2 of the document, and that is actually linked within the memo that is uh, within the agenda. Um, in addition, so to reflect Dr. Cog's contribution to the statewide travel survey, uh, $500,000 is being held back and directly paid to CDOT rather than transferring those funds back, be back and forth between the agencies. So the remaining $1.5 million in contributions uh, will be also held back in FY22 for a total of $2 million of Dr. Cog planning funds being used towards this endeavor. So uh, that is a quick summary of the amendment before you. And the motion before you would be to recommend to the RTC uh, these amendments to the 20 and 21 UPWP. Thank you, Todd. Are there any questions or comments for Todd? Please raise your hand and Melinda will call on you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will give everyone just a moment to get hands raised. Uh, it looks like we do have a hand raised from Art Griffith. Art, go ahead. Um, just a question. Could, could someone scroll the agenda um, at, to each of the items as we're going? Um, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Art. Are there any other questions or discussion? Let's see if there are any other hands. Um, I do not see any other hands raised. Okay. At this time, I would entertain a motion and a second for approval of this agenda item. Please use your raise hand icon to indicate you want to make a motion or a second. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like our first hand came from Brian Weimer. Brian, go ahead. I move to recommend the, to the Regional Transportation Committee amendments to the FY 2020 to FY 2021 Unified Planning Work Program as presented today. Thank you, Brian. Is in the second. Okay, just looking for another hand. Okay, looks like we have a second from Steve Durian. Steve, go ahead. I second that motion. Thank you, Steve. So it's been uh, moved and seconded to recommend to the Transportation Regional Transportation Committee amendments to the um, Unified Planning Work Program. Are there any more discussion? Uh, we do have a hand raise from Brian Weimer. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Looks like you're self-muted. I didn't put my hand down. So oh. can... <laughs> All right, sounds good. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, so being no uh, further discussion, we'll go ahead and vote on this. Uh, Melinda, if you'll once again unmute the uh, TAC members and alternates representing their members uh, for a verbal vote. All those yeah. in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Aye. All opposed signify by saying no. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to our next uh, item and it will be presented by Travis Noon. It's discussion of project funding for the January 2021 to June 2022 Human Services Transportation, known as HST, set aside program of the 2020 to 2023 Transportation Improvement Program and Federal um, Transit Administration Section 5310 programs. Travis? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so yes, I'm here to talk about the recommendations from our view committee for the 2021 Dr. Cog HST tip set aside and the 5310 Denver Aurora urbanized area projects. Um, so just a little bit of background, as you probably are all aware, uh, Dr. Cog became a direct recipient of the 5310 funding for the, the Denver Aurora urbanized area in December of 2019. Uh, that funding is approximately $2 million annually. It's a little bit less uh, for transit capital operating and mobility management projects uh, in the Denver Aurora area um, for older that benefit older adults and individuals with disabilities. All on that wall. All also, on that wall. I've sealed them Dr. Cog Human Services tip set aside uh, was adopted as part of the 2020-2023 tip policy, and that set aside a million dollars a year for four years, so a total of $4 million dollars. Uh, for the same types of projects, but beyond individuals with disabilities and older adults, it's also for other vulnerable populations. Both the, the HST was intended to complement 5310 and also the Older Americans Act funding uh, that the AAA administers from Dr. Cog. Uh, back in April, we released a call for projects for both of these two funding streams. Uh, the projects uh, that we received, the proposals we received, any contracts coming out of it, are intended to be 18 month projects beginning in January 1, 2021 and ending June 30th, 2022. Uh, the purpose for awarding 18 months um, is to align this, the fiscal year of these funds with the Older Americans Act funding uh, that's administered through the AAA. Um, and that will allow us to, to essentially in the year, in the coming years, announce a call for projects for all three funding streams and sort of better coordinate um, these funding streams. It is important to note that this is Dr. Cog's first call for the 5310 funding. Uh, prior years have been administered through CDOT. Um, we have been administering the HST for a little over eight months now for the 2020 year. Um, so the project selection, uh, we did have an independent review panel um, that reviewed both proposals and scored the criteria based on Dr. Cog's 5310 program management plan. Um, Dr. Cog's staff was a part of that review. However, we were non-scoring, non-voting members, um, and it was, uh, we were just there as technical advisors. Um, the, the committee was made up of individuals from different stakeholders across the region. Uh, their recommendations were attached to the agenda. You should all be able to see that, um, that spreadsheet. You can see that the highest scored projects were recommended for funding. Uh, we, the levels of funding were adjusted um, to match the projected available funds. Um, you can tell on that spreadsheet, there was about 6 million, I think 6.7 million that was asked for funding. Um, and we're looking at uh, 18 months, you know, we're looking at more like 4.3 million over those 18 months. Uh, so we did adjust down quite a, quite a bit of the projects to be able to fund the ones that were worth funding. There were a couple of projects um, that weren't recommended for funding. Uh, the committee felt that those were very limited in scope, concerned about the high cost for the limited um, or the small amount of individuals that are served under those projects, which is why they weren't recommended for funding. Um, and also per the Dr. Cog PMP, the program management plan for 5310, um, Dr. Cog was setting aside $57,000 approximately um, for annual maintenance on the Ride Alliance project, which is the hub um, for transfer, tra transferring trips between providers. Uh, the proposed motion here is moved to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee approval of the HST and FTA 5310 projects for January 1 through June 30th, 2022, as recommended by the peer review panel. Um, and at this time, I'm open to any questions that you all may have. Are there any questions for Travis today? Uh, 
Okay. Please raise uh, your hand. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'm coming in. Okay. Um, oh, well, let me see. Oh, yes, we do. Uh, looks like uh, we have a question from Brody Ayers. Brody, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Hi, guys. Josh, can you expand upon why uh, Continuum was not funded? Sure. Um, so again, that both of the two projects that were not funded, there was concerns about the, the high cost of those projects um, from the committee for the limited number of individuals or region that are, you know, um, area that's being served. So Continuum in their proposal mentioned that they only serve less than 90 clients um, for, you know, really a pro total project budget of almost $400,000. Um, and so there was concern there. Um, also, given a lot of the scoring is weighted on coordination with other transit providers and Continuum mentioned in their um, proposal that they are, don't generally, generally coordinate with other providers. So that's why they ended up scoring pretty low. Are there are other questions um, or discussion or comments for, for Travis. I'm looking to make sure there aren't any other hands. Okay, there are no other questions or comments from committee members. Travis, if you could put the motion back up, uh, we'll now entertain a motion and a second for approval of this item. Please use the raise hand icon to indicate you would like to make the motion or a second, and uh, you will be called on. Melinda? Okay. All right, looks like we have a hand raise from Steve Durian. Steve, go ahead. I'll move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee approval of HST and FTA 5310 <laughs> projects for January 2021 through June 2022, as recommended by the peer review panel. Thank you, Steve. Do we have a second, Melinda? Let's see, do we have a second? Uh, yes, we do, from Art Griffin. So, Art, go ahead. Yes, I second the motion. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any, any discussion uh, on this item? Um, please raise your hand on the motion itself. Melinda, do you have any hands raised? Uh, I do, I just wanna make sure, Art, uh, it looks like you might still have your hand raised or do you have a comment? No, you. I didn't put my hand down, but I thought you did that automatically. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, we'll do that now. Okay, then mm -hmm. uh, no, I see no other hands raised. No, thank you. All right, with that, uh, Melinda will once again unmute the TAC members and alternates uh, representing their members uh, for a verbal vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, signify by saying no. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Travis. <laughs> Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, this is Carol Buchanan. and I was abstaining because when our organization, one of the projects recommended. So. Okay, please show the abstention, Melinda. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to our next item, I've been informed that we have uh, two new members, and we usually introduce those at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, Kelly Heaton is right now feeling the great seat and David Julaine is uh, filling the aviation seat. Jacob, or do you have any additional on this? No, just by way of background of this, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Um, so each year, um, according to our committee guidelines, uh, we do an annual review of TAC membership with our board chair. Um, as I think most of you know, our TAC is comprised primarily of local government members and seven what we call special interest uh, seats. These are subject matter experts um, in the fields, um, you know, in transportation and relating to transportation. Those seven special interest seats are um, actually recommended by our board chair and approved by our regional transportation committee, uh, which they did back at their July meeting, I believe. Um, and so resulting from those actions, uh, we do have the two new members that um, that our chair just announced. So uh, welcome to both of you and we're glad to have you on TAC. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Jacob, and welcome to Kelly and David. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next action item, uh, which is discussion of the recommendation of projects to be funded through the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology, um, abbreviated RTO and T, set aside for the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program. And I understand Steve, Steve Cook and Greg McKinnon will be making that presentation. So I uh, turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Greg McKinnon, uh, the Regional Transportation Operations Program Manager. Uh, I will be making the presentation. Uh, it is attachment E in the packet, uh, if you'd want to refer to it. I'm hoping that my presentation is, is showing on the screen. It is. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so this is for the FY20 to 23 Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Set Aside. Uh, and this is the, we're going to be reviewing the review panel recommendations. Uh, just a, a heads up, this is um, uh, followed the same pattern as the other set asides where uh, there was a, a request for letters of intent and uh, the, uh, the peers came together, evaluated those letters, and then moved on to applications, uh, which were then evaluated by the review panel. So the review panel process, uh, we had come before the, the TAC uh, some months before uh, this year to go over the, uh, the process and the evaluation criteria. I have the evaluation criteria up, up on the, the screen to show um, the, the, the different categories that we the review panel was looking at. Uh, going over it uh, quickly, the, the first four items we're focused on the MetroVision and, and the, um, the, the Regional Transportation Operations Program objectives, which is you know, mainly uh, you know, improving the performance and reliability of the transportation system. And then highlighting uh, two other uh, important elements uh, from a regional perspective of improving collaboration and partnerships and uh, offering the opportunity for uh, innovation and transferability across the region. The next two scores were project need and project impact, which you can see from the weighting was a significant portion of, of the project uh, evaluation, the review panel's evaluation. Um, and, the, um, and then finally, the, the risk management plan was a, an attempt to, uh, because these are complicated uh, technology projects that uh, we're uh, looking to have the project sponsors uh, provide a, a uh, a clear analysis of the the risks that they're uh, anticipating uh, as they head into the application process, and expecting that that uh, will inform their uh, activities moving through the the whole project. Um, I'll keep this slide up, but to go over the the, the process, the review. Uh, panel process. Uh, for the first four uh, categories, uh, those were uh, 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 evaluated and, and assessed by each of the review panelists individually uh, and for the scoring process. The, the project need and project impact were uh, dealt with differently. The project need was a combination of the congestion mitigation process and the high injury network designations uh, depending on the project location and uh, uh, in, in the network. And so there was uh, different scores related on the, uh, what designations were relative to those uh, sections of the network. The project impact was uh, related to the air quality and congestion um, uh, benefits uh, that were reported in the application. Uh, those were converted to be common units and then were um, normalized based on the project cost that was associated with the, um, uh, the, the, the application. And then finally, the, you know, an assessment of the risk management plan as is, is indicated there. Um, whoops. So I, I just described all these uh, items here on this uh, slide. So the review panel outcomes, as is described in the, um, the memo, we'll get into that. We uh, prepared uh, an ordered list of the um, projects, uh, considering any eligibility exclusions, which I'll go to in a sec. Um, 
we as, uh, assess the project values against the, the, the available funds that are currently unobligated uh, as part of the, um, the uh, RTO and T set aside. And that was calculated to be about the 13.85 million that we show here. Then uh, as we're assigning funding to the projects, uh, the, uh, the review panel uh, uh, elected to, you know, you followed the guidance of providing, you know, about a million dollars maximum for projects. Uh, and so it, it, the three that are listed here are ones that were impacted. And I'll note that the, the you know, to make the project um, whole, uh, or kind of fit the, the standard of the way the project is deployed, the, the Boulder project was a little bit more than a million in terms of the recommended allocation. And then after all that was complete, uh, an order waiting list was prepared uh, in the case that there are project savings or, or funds returned to the pool or new, uh, new funds uh, that become available. So the eligibility exclusions that I noted, uh, you know, in the, uh, the the eligibility and selection process document that we we brought to the TAC uh, several months ago, uh, you know, that was used to determine you know some elements of the the projects that that weren't available, and, and they are noted here. Uh, and then in terms of uh, uh, eligibility altogether, there was a, a two projects that were determined not to be eligible uh, according to the uh, the eligibility rules uh, that we were following. So the recommended projects and amounts are listed here in the order of the uh, the criteria uh, ranking from the review panel. Uh, to highlighting some of the, the acronyms here so that you understand what we are. The, the Exhibit 2 has a, a very brief description of, of each of the projects associated with each of these. That might be uh, something to uh, reference if you want to know a little bit more about the project. But ATSPM uh, stands for uh, Automated Traffic Signal Program uh, Performance Measurement System. Uh, and uh, CCTV is uh, another name for the traffic cameras uh, that go up. Uh, the uh, the Bluetooth expansion is a travel time monitoring system, uh, but I think that pretty much everything else is self-explanatory in the uh, in what's there. The detection that that's listed is broadly related to things like the ATSPM, where advanced detection or detection um, you know several hundred feet in front of the stop bar of an intersection uh, is being uh, installed to help understand what the uh, the conditions are on a, a signalized network. The waiting list uh, is here. These are, are where the projects that uh, had remainders, where only partial funding was uh, was recommended, uh, or the the projects that uh, that um, weren't able to be funded uh, with the uh, the available funds that we had. Oh, I should probably know. Uh, on the previous slide, I had noted that there was um, some 13.8 um, uh, million uh, available, uh, but the review panel, uh, you know, after an assessment, decided to uh, fund to 14.3 million, uh, roughly here. Uh, the uh, additional funds are going to be uh, um, transferred crazy. from 14.3 million. Yes. Uh, the the um, uh, additional funds uh, to cover that are going to be transferred from the the traffic operations program uh, uh, support uh, that is the the two elements of the the regional transportation operations program where there's the the some funds for providing support uh, through the Dr. Cog staff and and consultants and contractors and uh, and then the capital expend expenditures that we're showing here. Uh, and then uh, also included in the packet, but just showing here that the, it's just a, a different representation of uh, of the listing, but um, the recommended uh, programming by year over the, the years. The way that this list was developed was uh, each of the applicants uh, submitted their preferred uh, year uh, to be funded. Uh, and there was uh, just some minor changes made for, of, uh, to be able to uh, balance the program so that all the funds were, were able to spread out through the three fiscal years. 
uh, with the blessing of the uh, the project sponsors. And then the other changes were the the uh, the reduction in funds due to any exclusions or uh, not being able to fully fund the, the, the project. And there's the second half of that table there. So I uh, don't know if we need to go much into this. We had uh, the review panel did uh, did the review selection process and recommendation uh, in July and uh, presented to the RTO working group uh, and the project sponsors uh, at, at the end of July and, and then made another presentation to the event that's mobility um, pro uh, partners uh, working group um, uh, at the beginning of August, and now we're moving through the the regular uh, committees and board presentations here in August and September, uh, with the uh, uh, intent to initiate the the FY21 project IGAs as as soon as practical after the board approves. So uh, I realized that we didn't include the uh, the the uh, action, so I'll just uh, read it that, you know, Dr. Koff staff recommends uh, um, approval to uh, of the projects to the uh, the Regional Transportation Com Committee um, as proposed by the RTOT set aside project review panel. And I'm able to take any questions now. Thank you. Are there any uh, questions for Greg? Uh, if so, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like our first question is from Art Griffith. So Art, go ahead. Yes, thanks. Um, so the motion is um, for the full 14.283 million. Um, the write-up talked about the 13, but I think your slides covered it. I just want to be clear. And I thought that was a, a good move to put in the extra money I don't remember the pot you said it was coming from, so that you could fund the full 14.283 million. Is that correct? Yes, that's the intention. Uh, um, uh, the 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 list adds up to that 4.14.283, as you say, which exceeds you know what was uh, originally available. But we we are just transferring funds within the set aside to be able to accommodate that. Okay, thank you. Other questions um, for Greg? Uh, yes, we do have another question uh, from Richard Pilgrim. Rick, go ahead. Um, hey, hey, Greg, uh, great presentation. And I, I probably should have attended the AMP with Emily Lindsay and, and brought this up there. In, in the criteria, could you go back to that slide? Um, you got the the uh, collaboration and partnerships criteria, um, it, it, and I, you know, people are probably tired of listening to stuff about mobility choice. But part of the blueprint was the uh, the premise that partnerships with the with the private sector are going to become more and more important going forward. And, and so I'm wondering to what degree would this criteria, it, you know, it says involves multi-agency or multi-jurisdictional collaboration. And, and I could see where the private sector might want to participate on a pilot project or on a, maybe on an in-kind. Uh, I, I, I have no clue what the Denver Bluetooth project is about, but there might be a way that um, an agency gets a, a partnership with a private sector entity and that might be a we might want to encourage that and we could do that through the criteria award so do you have any comment about that uh yeah the the intent of the program uh, from its inception was to get the jurisdictions to work together uh, better. Uh, and, and that was all the way back from the traffic signal system improvement program, uh, where the, being able to uh, provide better systems and better signal timing to provide better service to the, the community. Uh, 
so that's that's definitely the priority when we're talking about the collaboration and partnerships. It doesn't exclude the the private partners, as you say. Um, uh, but the the challenge uh, with the, the the funding type is that these are you know, seeking you know, capital projects, and a lot of the uh, uh, partnerships or the offerings uh, from uh, the private sector in this area are are in kind of the um, service provision, which uh, is is a tough thing uh, to to do because it doesn't have the the capital uh, pro investment part of it. So it doesn't exclude it, uh, but it wasn't highlighted uh, kind of like as you see in the text there. Uh, but the, the point is taken, you know, that that is something at the AMP level that, that we're looking to, um, to advance. And so, you know, the next round, that's something that uh, we look to build into the evaluation process. Yeah. Well, good. I think that might be something to, uh, to keep on on the list and pay attention to the or discuss it at least the next time see how it might fit thank you yes and and some i'll say that that some of the the partnership may be kind of hidden or uh you know from view because the the contractors are you know de facto partners uh you know when they are you know they they were the the project sponsors reach out to the contractors or vendors and saying, okay, well, this is what I'm looking for. And, and uh, they get assistance in coming up with the, the cost estimates. And, and there is a, a partnership that's developing that will probably, you know, following the uh, federal and state procurement rules will end up into, you know, closer uh, private public partnerships uh, for implementation. True. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Greg. Are there, is there any other questions for Greg? Uh, it does look like we have another question from Brian Weimer. Brian, go ahead. Yes, um, it looks like this would uh, allocate all the funding for this TIP cycle, is that correct? And then the next call would be uh, the next TIP cycle? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions, Melinda? Um, I do see that uh, Rick's hand is raised. I didn't know if he had another additional question or comment. Rick, did you need to speak? Okay, it looks like he put his hand down. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm kind of like Art, I keep forgetting, so. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay, I think we're good. Okay, uh, I did have one question for you, Greg. Um, in your motion, is that including the wait list? Uh, I mean, that your proposed motion, does that include the wait list also or just the projects? Uh, that's a good point, Kent. Uh, uh, intent is that, you know, what we presented in the memo, so the, the projects and then the wait list is, is uh, what it, it will guide us for any um, uh, funds that become available uh, outside of the, the original proposed list. Okay. Thank you. At this time, um, we'll entertain a motion and a second for approval of the item. Please raise your hand um, icon to indicate you would like to make the motion. And please include whether it includes the wait list or not. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, one thing uh, before or as you were speaking, uh, two hands went up and I just want to make sure they didn't have any additional questions or comments. Um, it looks like we had one uh, from Hank Braxma. Uh, Hank, go ahead. Looks like you're self-muted. Hank, if you're able to unmute yourself, there might be some technical difficulties going on. Um, we can move to uh, Art really fast. Art, did you have a question or comment before the motion? Um, no, I was ready to make a motion. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the other hands went up uh, to make the motion. Um, so I guess we could go with Art to make the motion. Okay. Yes. Um, I would like to make a motion uh, to support the list of projects for the RTO uh, T, as well as the waiting list for the amounts stipulated in the presentation of fourteen point two eight three million. No problem. Because I'm going through the computer at work. And That's and then. And then is that also to recommend approval or recommend to the uh, RTC? Yes, yes, approval to RTC, the list and the waiting list. 
Okay, thank you. I have a motion. Do we have a second? Uh, it looks like we do from Eileen Yazzie. Eileen, go ahead. I second the motion. Thank you, Eileen. So we have a, a motion and a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Please raise your hand. Okay, I will put all hands down at this moment. Okay, it looks like we do not have any additional questions or comments. Okay, um, therefore, um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Uh, Melinda, you'll need to unmute them for that. I'm sorry to remind us. Nope, to remind that's you. okay. Yep, everyone's unmuted. Okay, so all aye. those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. And any abstentions? Uh, motion passed unanimously. That concludes our action items. We'll move on to our informational briefings at this time. And I believe Andy Taylor will be making a presentation on the 2050 small area household and employment forecast for the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. Andy? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. Um, I'm Andy Taylor, and I'm just on the line to talk a bit about the small area forecast that's used in the regional transportation planning process here at Dr. Cock. I like to use this metaphor of a relay race to talk about where small area forecasting fits in the regional transportation planning process. We're not the first leg. Uh, the work starts before us with the state demography office. They're charged by state statute with creating forecasts for population, households, and jobs. And they do this work at state and county levels, publishing and updating forecasts for the counties annually, along with the work they do for annual estimates that you may be familiar with. Uh, we're the next leg. Uh, while they stop at 64 counties, we have to take their forecasts, what we call control totals, and distribute that growth across 2,800 small areas, uh, what we call transportation analysis zones or TAS. Uh, our forecasting work must stay nested within these county control totals. Uh, with this information at a TAS level, Dr. Cog and others can conduct travel demand modeling in order to forecast future travel patterns. Uh, the relay race metaphor will now fall apart when I want to try and mention uh, two feedback loops that happen outside the regional transportation planning process. Uh, the first is down in the, the right corner, uh, what we're calling the MetroVision gap analysis. Uh, MetroVision is the region's plan for the future uh, with the current version adopted unanimously by the board back in 2017. Uh, one of MetroVision's longstanding principles is that it respects local plans. So it's not our job as Dr. Cog or Dr. Cog staff to override local plans and zoning in our forecasting work to make the forecast look one way or another. Uh, however, another of MetroVision's longstanding principles is that it offers ideas for local implementation. So we intend to start highlighting the gap between uh, what this forecast shows and what our region's aspirations are in MetroVision in order to further the conversation about local and regional decisions that affect growth and development. Uh, the other item uh, is under the small area forecasting list there. Uh, we're talking about coordination with the State Demography Office on future county forecast updates. Uh, we're planning to work in 2021 to help local governments provide some constructive feedback on the state's county forecasts. Under current processes, that office publishes preliminary forecasts in around May or June of each year. Uh, they solicit feedback from counties and other local governments, and then they finalize that forecast in November. The work we intend to pilot would help local governments see how changes to the forecast at a county level might affect their jurisdiction and thus help them and their neighbors um, potentially argue for changes to these control forecasts. I've got some more process slides later, but I want to dig into some of the meat uh, of this forecast. Let's just start by look, looking at what we're working with for the forecast for the region. By 2050, we'll be shy of, we're forecast to be shy of just 3 million jobs and 1.9 million households. Please note that the 2020 that's reflected here is a pre-COVID forecast of 2020. 
So let's look at this a little bit by decade. Uh, the narrative around the last decade has often used terms like rapid growth. Uh, surely some of that growth, especially that job growth that you're seeing, uh, represents recovery from the Great Recession. However, if we just look back a decade or two before, uh, 2000 to 2010 was only 60,000. So average together, we'll, we'll get about 272,000 uh, jobs a decade just looking backwards. And so actually we're looking to add more households uh, this coming decade, this one that we're in now, than we did the last. And I've got some context coming up to explain a little bit of why and why that might not be a given. But the last 20 years of our forecast, 2030 through 2050, show slowing growth as some demographic realities start to catch up with us. So I'm gonna put this in a little bit more context, looking back a little further. We're actually expecting less growth in absolute terms over the next 30 years than we received over the last 30 years. I put percent change on here, even though it's hard without the absolute numbers to really see what that's in relation to, because it shows just how big the growth was and how it might've felt to people who were here uh, uh, going through it, how it was to compare to where we started our economy in terms of jobs came close to doubling between 1990 and 2020. And we're not even gonna grow by that same number going forth forward under this forecast. Uh, it's really hard for us to characterize our growth as rapid if we compare it to the last 30 years we just came out of. We can't assume that our past is just a template for planning for the next 30 years, um, but I, I have some more explanation coming up here. All this material that I've got on this slide uh, is borrowed directly from the State Demography Office. I've got a link here uh, to a 12-page report uh, that goes into it in more depth, uh, but I've tried to highlight some of the key points what's driving this forecast. Uh, first, we still have strong growth rate compared to the nation, but both, uh, but both rates are declining. We're not an island. The nation's growth rate is declining, and so is ours uh, in Colorado. Uh, some of that household growth that you saw 2020 to 2030, that's being driven by the second point on this slide here. We're facing an increasing number of retirements and we'll need to bring labor in through migration. This is not a given. There's lots of open questions. Will millennials reaching peak home buying years find entry level stock or move to a region with more attainable housing? Uh, will these workers potentially migrating in from other parts of the country or world still find potential uh, income here worthwhile after factoring in housing costs. There's just a lot at play here. It's not a given. Uh, our long run growth is slowing and it's about demographics. Uh, we've been experienced longer, experiencing lower birth rates since 2007. Uh, that compounds as these once potential kids aren't there in the future to have kids of their own. Uh, an older population also means lower fertility, higher propensity to move away, which would decrease net migration as shown here. Uh, and a tightening labor market is also due to demographics. It's just a matter of uh, who is of working age, which will also likely contribute uh, to slowing job growth. So with that important context, I wanna dwell on just some process slides of how we got, how we did our leg of this race uh, with the 2450 small area forecast. 2019 was a big year for model improvements, uh, moving to our model to the cloud, uh, improving how we estimated uh, capacity for future capacity for jobs and housing based on local zoning and plans, and adding the ability to factor in uh, some scheduled development. Uh, you've already seen some of our work with the, these model improvements uh, in the first couple quarters of this year during the forecast for scenarios. We used regional controls uh, for these scenarios, pooling together those county control totals, which gave us a bit more ability to differentiate between location choices uh, for those different scenarios. What you're about to see in this RTP forecast, uh, we'll be using county control totals instead of this pooled regional total. So even while you were seeing and discussing scenario work, we were pivoting to the small area forecast based on county control totals. May, June, and July were the most important months as we reviewed nearly 600 comments from 29 jurisdictions. 
since we started asking for feedback back uh, last September, we've heard from 31 total jurisdictions. And now we're here today to share some of the results, which are also available on our data catalog. So let's start with the 2020 and 2050 household forecasts. The darker the area, the more households, uh, the greater the concentration. White or transparent on this map doesn't necessarily mean no households. It's just below the threshold that we used uh, for the bottom level of this map in terms of concentration. Often when we look at these forecasts, we have a tendency to just dive right in and focus on what the change is between, say, 2020 and 20, 2050. Uh, but what I like about starting here is reminding ourselves that we have a lot of households in this region already and seeing just how many parts of the region look largely the same. Uh, here's the same set of maps for jobs. Uh, if you're picking out areas on the map you were hoping to see highlighted but don't, please hold on. I've got a couple growth maps. Uh, those might give you a chance to see uh, where there may be some change uh, that, that may not be showing up uh, uh, with enough concentration uh, to really pop on one of these maps. Um, and also remember, we have a limited amount of growth to work with in our control totals. And so there's a, there's a lot of uh, job uh, capacity for jobs uh, that there's just not enough uh, forecast job growth to fill all that. Uh, here are the maps showing change between 2020 and 2050. The darker the color, the greater intensity of growth. Uh, the whole series of maps that I just showed is available as a PDF for download, along with the spatial data on our data catalog. So if you want to look at these uh, in a little bit bigger format, want to zoom in a little bit, uh, there, there's a chance to do that there. Um, so uh, please uh, feel free. Uh, I think the link is in both the memo and uh, on this slideshow. So just a little bit about what's next. Uh, we'll be taking this item, informational item to RTC and the board before Dr. Cog uses these forecasts in air quality conformity modeling for the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. In the meantime, we'll begin illustrating the gap between this forecast and the aspirations in MetroVision uh, with a likely presentation of some analyses to the board work session uh, in early October. Into 2021, we'll be considering some additional model improvements uh, and piloting some of the work that I mentioned uh, previously with the state demography office around county forecasts. And with that, I'll turn it back over to the chair in case there are any questions. Thank you, Andy. Um, is there any questions or comments uh, for Andy? If you please raise your hand. Okay, I'll give everyone just a moment to get hands raised. Okay, and at this time, I do not see any hands raised. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't say thank you to, to you and all your coworkers and local jurisdictions that provided feedback. Um, thank you very much for all that, that time and insight we received. Um, Andy, I wanted to thank you and your team also for reaching out and really working with the local jurisdictions on, on the uh, forecast this time. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, we'll move on to the uh, next informational briefing. Um, it's a summary of engagement activities for phase two of the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. And I believe Jacob Rieger has that presentation. Jacob? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will kick this off at least. Um, again, Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager, Dr. Cog. So we've been engaged in um, pretty heavy technical sort of conversation with the TAC over the last several months, um, a lot of work on the technical side. So we wanted to take this opportunity to actually update you on what we're doing on the public and stakeholder engagement side uh, for the 2050 MBRTP. One of the uh, things that we did as part of um, entering into the 2050 planning process was to actually create uh, an engagement plan specific to our 2050 work to guide our activities um, over the over the life of the planning process. While that's changed obviously a little bit with COVID, uh, we've done a lot of public and stakeholder engagement, um, beginning with the formal sort of plan kickoff last you know last spring summer, um, and continuing through now. Um, aligning with the overall project, we broke this up into kind of four phases. Uh, so phase one was last summer and fall. 
uh, with some of the initial outreach, uh, visioning, education work, information work that we did. Um, so we're, what we're going to talk about today is the public and stakeholder engagement activities that we've done as part of phase two, uh, which is roughly over the winter um, and into uh, the spring of this year. Uh, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Lisa Hood, our public engagement specialist. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm Lisa Hood. So I'm just going to provide a brief summary of our public engagement activities and the input that we've received over the last several months on the 2050 MVRTP. Um, just to show you a timeline of what kind of Jacob was talking about, as he mentioned, the MVRTP process is divided up into four main phases of engagement. So we completed phase one um, kind of in fall of last year, and we summarized those activities for you at a TAC, TAC meeting, um, I think last September or October. And then phase two took place between November and July. Um, and that one was really focused on scenario options and investment priorities. And so kind of the question, um, just since I haven't seen you in a few months, how did the input from phase one guide phase two? So what we heard from the public during phase one was integrated into the development of the scenarios of phase two. So that included a focus on studying transit, walking and biking, and safety impacts. And a lot of the time while we were in that second phase was really in the developing and, and testing of those scenarios. And so the focus of the um, general public engagement really occurred over this um, late spring, early summer. One of the more most exciting things that um, we did in phase two was convene these two new advisory groups, which you all have heard a little bit about um, in some of the other MVRTP updates, but we've convened both a youth advisory panel and a civic advisory group. And both of these groups are bringing valuable insight and guidance to the planning process. So I'll start with the youth advisory panel. We've had three meetings so far with this group of high school students and they are all um, teenagers who also sit on their own city's youth commission. So they're brought together in kind of this regional format. And so far we've talked to them about their vision for transportation in 2050, what transportation measures were most important for them to use in assessing the, tr the scenarios, and how the actual scenario results should inform investment priorities. Next, the civic advisory group. This is a group of interested residents who aren't typically or haven't previously participated in transportation planning processes. Um, the group is intended to represent kind of the diversity and communi of communities and experiences in the Denver region. And they've had similar discussions and activities as the youth, act, the youth advisory panel um, at their first three meetings. So kind of um, the three or the, the key guidance from both of these groups, there's been a repeated emphasis from both groups about the high importance of investment in transit, as well as travel choices such as walking and biking. Also equitable access to transportation and reducing greenhouse gas emissions have also been consistently identified as top priorities for both of these groups. Another main strategy for phase two was the creation of this online engagement site. And while this was originally planned to be part of the um, phase two anyway, it actually proved to be particularly useful as COVID arrived and we could no longer hold in-person events or attend any events over the summer to solicit feedback. So on this site, we developed a budget game, which I'll show a little screenshot of what it looks like or what it looked like as well as a survey in order to receive feedback on the scenario results. So people were given a $100 budget to spend on the different scenarios based on what outcomes or results they valued most from those scenarios. We also developed short videos to explain the results in both English and Spanish. So I think we took what was an hour long TAC presentation and condensed it into six to eight minutes for the public. Uh, the results of the budget game are shown here. Uh, most of the votes uh, for those land use focused scenarios in fill and centers were kind of first and second, but that was followed closely by the travel choices scenario, and then about half as many votes for the transit scenario. As you can see, there were very few respondents who voted to fund the off-peak congestion or the managed lanes and operations scenarios. There was also a follow-up survey where people were, um, could provide some more input about the scenarios. So 
Um, one of the highlights from that was that they were asked to identify what the most important goals for the Denver region to achieve by 2050 are. And number one was to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And then actually the least important um, to the respondents of all of those goals was to reduce tra traffic delay time. And we've also been um, engaging stakeholders throughout phase two. So and that has mainly been in the form of the county transportation forums uh, where we have briefed and provided feedback um, uh, or received feedback throughout this phase two of the process. And then we've also been um, giving presentations to regional partners um, over the last several months as well. So that's kind of a summary. What I really want um, you to take away from this presentation are these key takeaways. So um, first is really the link between land use and transportation. Although this isn't necessarily something that can be exactly incorporated into the MVRTP, it's clear that this connection needs to be further studied by Dr. Cog and its member governments as it did make significant impacts to the scenarios and the land use changes to support these transportation outcomes were widely supported by the public. And then second, throughout our engagement efforts, there was significant public support for projects that emphasize transit and walking and biking trips. Those consistently rank very highly on respondent priorities. But also projects that reduce vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions were top public priorities as well. So these priorities should be thought about and integrated into the project selection process. And then one interesting thing to note, although the folks who have participated in our engagement efforts consistently say that traffic congestion is an issue in the region, reducing travel time and congestion consistently rank very low on their investment priorities. So throughout, and also throughout phase one, there was very minimal public support for funding new roads. And um, as you can see through the budget game, phase two of the engagement showed very limited support for either the managed lanes or the off-peak congestion scenarios. So those are the key takeaways from the public input for you all to consider as the plan process moves to its next steps. And those next steps, um, we have the advisory groups are meeting um, in early September to provide feedback on the project solicitation and evaluation process. And we're now moving into phase three of the project. Uh, that's the plan development phase, and that'll occur through the rest of this year. In phase three, more than um, the, some of the other phases have been, that will heavily emphasize and focus on the stakeholder input side of this, while still ensuring that the next steps respond to the public input that we've received in phase one and phase two. And then in phase four, we'll be focusing on reviewing the draft plan and ensuring that the draft reflects the vision and priorities of the public, um, and we'll have lots of public input opportunities during phase four as well. So. That's all I have for you today. And um, I'll pass it back to the chair and ask if there are any questions. Are there any questions for Jacob or Lisa? Please raise your hand and Melinda will call on you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, looks like we have our first question or comment from Art Griffith. Art, go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, so I thought the money game was interesting. I think it's the same one that I took um, and I thought it was a good indication, but I felt there was restrictions in that you had to pick certain amounts that what didn't allow you to take a hundred dollars and like spend um, thirty dollars on cheesecake and forty dollars on pizza and two dollars on Pepsi. And I, I felt if we were to do something like that in the future, that we shouldn't restrict the allocations or predetermine the sub choices but, but maybe maybe the one that went to the public was different than the one i took thank you hi art thanks for that comment i think that's really helpful um i i definitely um i hear that that um the technical there was a technical difficulty with the online engagement site where you couldn't um, break it into smaller pieces, and that's kind of why we went with that approach. Um, however, the the kind of percentages or the costs that we allocated for each scenario did match up with some of the funding um, uh, the funding expectations um, for what each one of those would cost. 
Um, so it did line up with if you were to fully fund each one, uh, but I completely understand that um, being able to have a little bit of everything might have been um, a different way to approach it. And we can certainly uh, try to address that next time. Well, I thought the information was still helpful in, in your decision ma making. I just thought if we're talking about choices and letting them play the allocation game, give them a little more freedom, perhaps the right. software issue can be solved in the future. Right, definitely. It definitely made it a harder game to play. <laughs> Thank you, Art. Um, any other hands raised, Melinda? At this time, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Thank you, Jacob and Lisa, for the input, and we look forward to seeing some more on this. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to move on to some administrative items. Uh, first, um, the EMP working group update, and I think Carson, you, a priest, do you have an update for us? And so if you would unmute Carson, I'd appreciate it, Melinda. Yep. I do, Carson. thank you, Mr. Yep. Chair. And Melinda, looks like I was able to unmute. So I will jump into it. Um, the AMP working group met earlier this month to discuss some next steps for the focus area subcommittees that have been meeting over the course of the last few months as they prepare to report out to the AMP steering committee uh, in September. The working group heard updates from each of those subcommittees that include data and data sharing, shared mobility, and system operations. The AMP working group went through a prioritization ranking process during this meeting to choose some quote unquote, most important tactical actions to move forward with um, in terms of next steps. As an example, the tactical actions that scored the highest included things like establishing a regional mobility data sharing platform and coordinating traffic management center systems and operations. The group also heard informational briefings from the city of Westminster on their Easy Mile autonomous vehicle pilot project. Them that's been running, and they also heard from Greg McKinnon with the same update we heard today, similar update about the RTO and T set aside. Um, full meeting, and I'd be happy to take any questions if you have them, um, if I'm able to answer them, or Emily Lindsay, if not. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there any questions for Carson? Please raise your hand or comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, give just a moment. And I don't see any hands raised. Okay, thank you. Are there any other uh, member comments or other matters? If so, uh, to bring before the TAC, if you would uh, raise your hand. So, Mr. Chair. Yes. Go ahead, Jake. Jacob. Jacob, I know that I know that Ron and I have a couple staff updates once um, once we get through member updates. Okay, thank you. All right, and uh, at this time, I don't see any hands raised. All right. Um, Jacob, if you'd go ahead then, or Ron. Sure. Go. Um, I'll start. Um, so again, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cox staff, um, wanted to give an update on the 2050 MBRTP uh, project solicitation and evaluation process. I want to start that update by thanking everyone uh, very much. I think almost everyone on this call was involved in one way or another uh, with the work that's been uh, ongoing over the last few weeks. Uh, working through the county transportation forums, the sub-regional forums. Uh, we've also been working with CDOT and RTD. Everyone's been engaged in a very uh, meaningful and informative conversation about identifying uh, candidate investment priorities for the 2050 MVRTP. Um, again, really appreciate everyone's time, both in the forum meetings uh, and the time of putting together the project submittal forms. Um, so now that those are uh, coming to us, um, the work will shift to actually to Dr. Tug's staff and into the evaluation process. Uh, we're anticipating evaluating somewhere around 130 uh, candidate projects between the county forums um, and the regional agencies. So Dr. Tug's staff over the next couple of weeks will be reviewing um, and qualitatively scoring uh, those project submittal forms um, using the methodology that we've explained through, uh, through the last uh, several weeks at, at various forum meetings and with TAC. Um, again, this really goes back to the process that TAC recommended approval back in back at your June 22nd meeting and the Dr. Cog board approved at its July meeting. Um, so as we get into this evaluation phase, again, Dr. Cog staff will be reviewing and qualitatively scoring project submittal forms over the next two weeks. Then we will convene uh, the regional evaluation panel 
um, the week of September 7th, so right after Labor Day, we're in the process of scheduling that meeting. Um, that will include uh, representatives from each of the county transportation forums, as well as the three regional agencies. Um, from there, so that, that uh, panel will, will do that work um, in early September. Uh, from there, uh, we will, um, as we agree to in the process approved by the Dr. Cog board, uh, working with the three regional agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD, um, to review those rec uh, recommendations um, and to create the draft um, interagency regional uh, investment and project program priorities for the 2050 and VRTP. Then we will bring all of that to TAC um, and then to um, uh, to the Dr. Cog board for approval in October. With that approval, we will then be able to proceed with air quality conformity modeling and some of the other technical work that we need to do to put the 2050 plan together. So I know that was a lot of detail. I just wanted to give folks that update um, and be transparent about the next steps in the process. And I'd be happy to take any questions on that. Are there any questions for Jacob? Please raise your hand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do have a question or comment from Eileen Yazi. Eileen, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Hi, Jacob. Um, thank you so much for this um, overview. Um, I may have missed this in the quick uh, briefing that you just gave. When will you be coming back to the sub-regional forums for an update? So Eileen, I didn't specifically mention that in the update I gave, but to answer that question, um, we will update the sub-regional forums sort of based on everyone was on a little bit of a different meeting schedule um, before we, we worked you all to death over the past four to six weeks. Um, so as those meetings um, get scheduled over the fall, uh, we will certainly come back and give updates. I should also mention that through this regional evaluation process that I outlined, you know, we certainly anticipate that as we start putting this all together, because that's the point of the regional evaluation, we're going to look at everything at a holistic regional level. We anticipate as we start doing that, that um, start piecing together what we heard from the forums and from the regional agencies, um, that we'll have questions, uh, maybe ask for a little bit more information. So it will be a two-way conversation between the regional evaluation process and the forums as we go forward in evaluation. Jake, Jacob, this Sorry, this is Ron Papsdorf, Transportation Planning and Operations Director, Dr. Cog. I just wanted to supplement that a little bit, if I might, and say that the, there's not an expectation that the forums need to schedule a forum meeting for that. The, the feedback and conversations really will be from Dr. Cog's staff um, as necessary with the forum staff contact. And then... Um, when there are sort of forum meetings scheduled, we were happy to provide sort of an update on the process and how we reached our, our recommendations. Okay, thank you. Eileen, did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Okay, thank you. Are there any other hands raised? Uh, yes, we do have another hand raised from Art Griffith. Art, go ahead. You look to be self-muted. Sorry about that. I had to find it. Um, <laughs> so thanks for taking my question. So it's along the same lines, but uh, Ron clarified most of what my question was with his statement. Um, but just when would when would this recommendations go to the TAC, and would you suggest updating our um sub-regional transportation forms after it, it went through the TAC or or what would you, what would your advice be? Ron, do you want to tackle that or would you like me to? <laughs> I can I'll, t I'll I'll start and then Jacob can um correct it and provide the correct information. Um our so one thing, the next meeting um, listed on the agenda um, for September 28th, we're actually proposing that we um, delay that meeting, reschedule that meeting to October 5th, uh, just to give all of us a little bit more time to coordinate with among the three agencies, Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RPD, and so that we have uh, enough time to sort of have that back and forth dialogue as necessary with um, local staff and the staff of the sub-regional forums. So there's a little bit more time uh, before the recommendation will be forwarded to TAC. Um, I, I think 
the level of conversation that you have as staff with your forum members um, might depend on what you see in the recommendation that comes forward from CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog uh, to go to go to the TAC. And we will do our level best to, to get at least a preview of that recommendation out as soon as we can in advance of the TAC meeting. Um, and I would I would leave it up to the lead staff to the subregions to decide what level of conversation they want to have with the forum either before or after TAC, but certainly before uh, probably board action on that recommendation. Okay, Jacob, does that, that answer you? Consistent with how you would see it? Yeah, it is, and I think just the theme in in the questions from both Eileen and Art so allow me to emphasize that. This will be as open and transparent a process as, as it possibly can be. Um, I know that you all have been engaged at the forum level and sort of developing these candidate projects. Um, it's not like we walk away and don't communicate with you again. We will communicate with you throughout the process. Uh, we will share information as we have it. Um, things will not be a surprise when they come forward. Don't know if everyone will like all the recommendations, but we will share that information transparently as it's developed and as we go forward so that there is open communication between now and the October board meeting. Okay. Thank you, Ron and Jacob. Are there any other questions for, for Jacob or Ron regarding the uh, 2050 update they just gave? Uh, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Uh, I do have one additional question. You know, our RTP also includes locally, 100% locally funded projects. When are you wanting those submitted uh, so that you can do your air quality modeling? Yeah, that's a good question, Mr. Chair. So let me try to answer it. Kind of three quick related things on that. We did an initial solicitation back several months ago asking folks at the time, you know, based on the locally funded projects in the 2040 plan, you know, at that time, did local project sponsors have any changes or updates to those? Um, so we took in that information. We anticipate perhaps doing a second round of that, um, frankly, pretty soon, um, just, you know, to sort of update based on everything that's been done to date, uh, to have you all take kind of one more look at that and see as local as jurisdictions, um, as project sponsors, those projects, you know, kind of where you land on that now. And then the third piece of that, and this is consistent with how we typically do this process, we recognize that once the regional evaluation recommendations are known and those go forward to the Dr. Cog board, that that may, at least in small way, influence just a little bit of what a uh, particular jurisdiction might want to fund as a locally funded project. So to be a little more intentional about that, for example, if there's a candidate project that's been submitted uh, through this process that I've talked about today and it ultimately is not recommended for the financially constrained plan, maybe that project sponsor wants to come back and say, hey, we will, you know, we will locally fund that project. So that won't be known until, you know, late September into October, um, but we will sort of account for that in what we bring forward to the board so that we can make those updates as well uh, before we get into air quality conformity modeling. Does that make sense? Yeah. Then the other question I had is, um, I know a lot of times where we review the network itself um, to, to either add or remove like principal arterials or change them from a principal arterial to a major regional arterial. Uh, when will that discussion take place? So that was part of the kind of first piece of technical input along with the locally funded projects that we did a few months ago. Um, we received input on proposed changes to the regional roadway system. Um, we have decided that as staff, we feel like we can do that administratively. Um, again, if you all want to see it, but uh, we're happy to show you the, the outcomes of that, but um, the changes were not substantial. And so, um, again, we felt like as staff that it was reasonable that we could make those up, those requested updates and changes to the regional roadway system. Okay. Yeah, I know in the past that we've approved those, so it would be good to at least bring it as an informational item, I think. Yeah, we can certainly do that. I think to not trying to, yeah, not trying to hide the ball on anything. It's just, frankly, it's it's important, but it is a little bit of a bureaucratic sort of um, exercise. So, um, trying to save you from <laughs> from that piece of it, but we're certainly happy to show that work as an informational item. Okay. Are there any other hands raised, Melinda? Uh, not that I am seeing. No. Okay. Um, did, Jacob, did you have another item you, you wanted to speak about? Um, Mr. Papsdorf has an item. 
Yes, thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah just um, I know since it's been just just over a week since the application period closed for the Safer Main Streets um, grant program, the the joint. Uh, funding program between Dr. Cog and CDOT focused on uh, safety improvements around the region and multimodal improvements. Just wanted to give you give the committee a little bit of an update on what came in and I'd, I'd certainly open it up to CDOT to add any additional information they would like to. But uh, there were about 46 applications that were submitted um, to CDOT requesting a total of $113 million. You'll remember that we expect to have um, a maximum of about $77 million available to fund. So again, very competitive grant program. About half of the applications uh, were for projects on state highways. Uh, there were nine applications in the Region 4 part of Dr. Cog, requesting a total of about $12 million uh, in, in uh, grant funding. Um, so that's the update on what came in in terms of applications. Um, the uh, the uh, scoring panel um, made up of uh, Dr. Cog staff and CDOT staff is furiously uh, evaluating all of those applications that came in um, over the next uh, week and a half or so. Um, and then uh, CDOT will be convening uh, the review panel that uh, has representatives from uh, each of the Dr. Cog subregions, as well as um, CDOT staff and Dr. Cog staff, to evaluate that scoring and make an initial um, recommendation, and then uh, CDOT and Dr. Cog together will make the final the final funding recommendation based on all of that information. Um, and if there's someone on if in the meeting from CDOT that that would like to add anything else, feel free to raise your hand, and we'll we'll get you in the queue. Thank you, Ron. Melinda, are there any hands raised? Uh, it looks like uh, Paul DeSantis. Uh Paul, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not going to add a whole lot there, Ron. You did a good job explaining where we're at. Um, actually, I just want to thank the scoring panel in advance because 46 applications, and I've looked through the list. It's a list of great projects, and those people are going to be really busy. So my thanks in advance to everybody. And CDOT's really excited about it right now. So. Thank you all for submitting. Thank you, Paul. Ron, did you have any other updates or Jacob? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I did not. Okay. Uh, I noticed our next meeting, September 28th, but you mentioned October 5th. Do you want to go into a little more detail on that? Jacob can address that. Okay. Yeah, again, Mr. Chair and everyone, that's simply just to give um, the evaluation process for the 2015 VRTP candidate projects, you know, just a little bit more time to make sure we work through, um, again, both the uh, staff review and scoring, the regional evaluation panel uh, review of that work and initial recommendations, and then the three agency, interagency process to, uh, to look at that work and make final recommendations. So there's a lot, um, just as you all have been very busy over the past four to six weeks, uh, we're now going to be extremely busy over the next month or so. So it's simply to just give that process enough time to play out uh, with the time and, and thoughtfulness that it deserves uh, so that we can be ready to bring this to TAC at your next meeting. Okay, thank you. So do you want to do October 5th as the next meeting instead of September 28th? Is that what I'm hearing, Jacob? That's correct, Mr. Chair. So it's just the following Monday from our regularly scheduled meeting. Okay. Uh, are there any other matters to bring before the the, uh, the attack from the members? I don't see any hands raised. Okay. Oh, actually one just went up from Art Griffith. Art, go, go ahead. ahead. Art. So um, we should um, count on the meeting on the 5th then. It's, it is moving to the 5th. That's decisions made then today, October 5th. Yes. That's my understanding. Okay. Yes. Thanks. And I assume Melinda or somebody will send out a uh, meeting notice on that change. Correct. We will we will get that out as soon as we can, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, being no further matters, and the next meeting being October 5th uh, at 3 o'clock, I adjourned the meeting. Thank you.